here to introduce our plenary speaker this morning, um, Brian Harvey, and he's a senior lecturer emeritus at University of California, Berkeley. Yes, and he was. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and you know, most of you would know um, of his work. Um, a lot of people are using uh, SNAP, uh, BYOB across the world, including myself um, in higher education, computer science. So it's a, a real honor to have you here with us today. So please welcome. Um, okay, so, wow, I'm innocent. Um, okay, so um, what I'm here to talk about is um, something that's happening in the United States that I've been gathering is also happening in the rest of the world. So I'm hoping uh, there'll be an opportunity for some discussion, um, which is that after decades of neglect, uh, all of a sudden, every child in every school in every year, K-12, has to study computer science. Um, and this is both good and bad. And um, to show you both the good and the bad, um, here's a trailer from a movie. We divide the day up uh, in high schools into bits of time, you know, into 40 or 50 minute blocks typically, and then we ring bells and people start to shuffle around the building and do something else. That's an organizational device, it's not an educational principle. Ten university heads in 1890 said, in 11th grade everyone should learn chemistry, in senior year everyone should learn physics. A lot of these subjects are great, but these priorities were, were dictated 124 years ago. The old blue-collar industrial model of education is already gone. We're already living in its wake. What happens to society when hundreds of millions of people have that aimless, rudderless feeling of, I've been replaced by a very small box? I don't know if there's a solution. We all learn in different ways. This isn't the way to do it. This is the way that I did it. If the assignment is, you get it back and you crumple it up and throw it in the trash can, that's kind of one student experience. And if the assignment is to produce something that you're gonna to present to professionals in the field, that's completely changing the, the whole dynamic. We are trying to have that type of perplexity and curiosity get inculcated in our students. Saying your parents, all your friends' parents, and a bunch of people you don't know are going to be here to see the work you did. It creates a, an aspect of authenticity because we are creating something for an audience. The things I think in life that give us some of the greatest satisfaction is making something that wasn't there before. And I can't wait for that moment when it does work and I'm completely done with it. And it's like all leaves. It, it'll be one of the greatest moments in my life. The kids have that feeling it's transformative for them. I made this, and everyone's coming to look at it. OK. So um, there's good news and bad news in this, uh, which is, I mean, it's a movie, but it's very representative of the thinking of uh, US political leaders. They showed it to us at a meeting at the White House about um, you know, what's going to happen to the high school of the future. Um, so the good news is that um, kids are working on projects of their own design. Uh, we're supposed to get kids to be creative and take risks. Uh, risk taking is something that was a big buzzword at, at this meeting. Um, and, uh, and that's great. By the way, um, there were wooden gears in that picture, just like the ones that I saw at the Fab Lab upstairs. So that seems to be a thing. Um, the bad news is uh, 
the whole thinking behind why they want to do this, uh, which is, uh, well, in the 20th century, what we needed was mindless drones. Um, so let's have um, an education system that churns out you know, mindless factory workers. And now it's the 21st century, and what we need to staff our businesses is people who can think creatively. Um, and so this whole new set of ideas that's never existed before uh, is now the way to do things. And as you all know, every piece of that is wrong. Um, so it's not as if it was okay to turn out mindless drones um, 16 years ago, or 17 years ago. No, 16. Um, and now all of a sudden it isn't. Uh, it was never okay. Um, and furthermore, uh, some of us were doing this alleged 21st century work, um, not only in the 20th century, but um, depending on whether you want to count Socrates or not, um, at least 300 years ago, and maybe quite a lot more. Um, and these people don't seem to know any of that history. Um, and furthermore, um, they're not saying, you know, it's good for kids to be creative and independent thinkers. No, they're saying it's good for business, right? And if in the 22nd century, we go back to needing mindless drones, then we'll, you know, go back to the old way. Um, so if your goal is to produce what business wants, um, that's a fragile basis for introducing uh, what we all know as progressive education. Um, that's the bad news, okay? And uh, so this is not only happening in the United States. So uh, the uh, British beat us to it by half a year or so. There was a big thing about the, you know, K-12 computer science for every kid. Um, and I think it's starting to happen all over. Um, but the other problem is, um, if the people doing it don't really fully believe in the progressive vision, which they by and large don't, um, they're gonna do it in peculiar ways. Uh, so for example, so I have to tell you about this White House thing. Um, over the last couple of months, <clears throat> There's been a whole series of events uh, put on by Obama um, bringing teachers to the White House and bringing uh, curriculum people like me to the White House and um, announcing huge amounts of money being poured into improving schools. Um, so. Um, just the other day, there was an announcement about four billion, that's, you know, 10 to the ninth power dollars um, that is going to be uh, allocated to um, curriculum development a little bit, but mainly te teacher preparation, which is a big issue because uh, we don't have the teachers who know anything about computer science to teach all of these kids in every grade, K-12, in every school. Um, so uh, I'm involved in that work of teacher preparation, and that's why they invited me to this event, um, which was, I think, the beginning of that whole series of events. Um, and uh, they put us in, in groups to do brainstorming about various things. And we were assigned to groups more or less randomly. And I was in a group about maker spaces. And um, people started talking about, well, what counts as a maker space? And so, for example, everyone agreed that if the teacher tells you what to do, it's not a maker space. You know, even if you have laser cutters and stuff. Um, and then I said, um, and of course you can't give grades on the projects. 
right? If you want to tell kids that uh, they should be risk takers, uh, you can't then say, ha ha, you took a risk and failed, F. Um, and nobody bought that argument. You know, they, I mean, they didn't just ignore it, they came back and said, well, you know, you can have a whole series of projects that people do, and if somebody fails at one of them, you make the grading work out in a way that that's okay. Um, but, or you can, you know, grade on effort or various other things. But, but the whole idea that maybe you just don't grade this kind of activity, um, they couldn't take that in. Because really the whole point of education is to um, separate sheep from goats um, by, you know, putting gold stars on some kids' foreheads and not others. Um, oh, parenthesis, in the brave new world of the 21st century, not everyone is going to be a computer programmer, no matter what is in the curriculum. So, you know, that's another reason why making this be all about jobs is really problematic. Um, so, uh, what's our stance toward this? Um, I'm not turning down their money um, because, <laughs> because I think, you know, my group is doing good work and, you know, was doing good work before they came along with all this money. Um, and I'm happy to have the money to do it with. Um, but it's still going to be an uphill battle um, to get good things to happen in schools. So right now, I mean, to get into a little bit of detail, um, there are two big efforts underway to get computer science into American high schools. One of them is um, a course called Exploring Computer Science uh, that came out of the Los Angeles School District. Um, it was like the second biggest one in the country after New York where we're working. Um, and uh, it's designed as a freshman course. Uh, I think it's a middle school course, but they think it's a high school freshman course. Sorry, high school freshman is ninth grade, which means uh, nine and five is 14 year old kids um, are, are gonna take this course. And the other one, which is what I'm involved with, is a thing called computer science principles. Um, it's meant for 11th graders, so uh, 16 to 17 year olds. Um, and uh, it's labeled as an advanced placement course. So for those of you who are not from the United States, which I guess is practically everybody, um, the United States has a very unusual educational system in that there is no national curriculum. Um, in fact, for the most part, there isn't even a state curriculum in each of the 50 states. Um, instead, curriculum is uh, put into place by each local school district, um, which at the high school level usually means each individual high school, but maybe it's two high schools together. Um, unless you're in a huge city like New York or LA where it's bigger. Um, so if you want to get some curriculum innovation into every high school in the United States, uh, you have to go visit every school district in the United States, which is several thousand, you know, tens of thousands of school districts, um, unless it's an advanced placement course. Advanced placement is this program run by a uh, private nonprofit corporation called the College Board, which was set up by a bunch of universities. Um, to offer uh, university level courses to high school students. And the College Board sets curriculum standards for each of these and um, uh, more importantly uh, carries out testing every year 
So you take an AP test on this subject. Um, so computer science principles, there's always been a computer science AP, always, you know, not always, always, but for a long time. And to a first approximation, nobody takes it. Um, and among that nobody, to a first approximation, none of them are girls. Um, and almost all of them are white or Asian. Um, and why is this? It's because it's a programming course in Java. So, you know, you spend two weeks learning about public, void, static, whatever that is, uh, before you can add two and two, um, let alone do something fun. So uh, that exam is still there, but now there's this new one starting next year. This school year, it doesn't exist yet, but next school year is the first one when they're offering the exam. Um, it's not really an advanced placement level course. Um, the idea is that um, it's a university level course for non-computer scientists. So one of these breadth courses that you offer to the whole rest of the university. Um, so in that sense, it's a college level course, but it's really pretty easy compared to any other AP. Um, but also, they didn't really write a curriculum. They wrote a curriculum framework. And the framework consists of um, seven big ideas. Um, actually, I can probably bring them up here if I... Internet. Look at that. Internet. Oh, come on, computer. Okay. So here are the seven big ideas. Uh, creativity. Good. Abstraction. Data and information. Algorithms. Programming, which is different from algorithms. Um, the internet and global impact, meaning, you know, how do computers affect people's lives. And then there are um, six computational thinking skills, and here they are. Connecting computing, which means connecting it to other stuff in your life or in some professional field or whatever. Creating computational artifacts. This is my favorite. What's a computational artifact? Could be a PowerPoint presentation. Could be a movie. Could be a song, you know, that you made in GarageBand. Um, oh, yeah, it could be a computer program. Um, abstracting. Uh, analyzing problems and artifacts. I'm not sure about that one either. Uh, and then communicating and collaborating, which are certainly valuable skills, but I don't see what they have to do with computer science, particularly. Um, you know, like um, biologists don't communicate or collaborate. Um, so among the skills of computer scientists, programming isn't one of them. And, you know, how could any rational human beings possibly come up with a list like that? Well, you see, girls, goes the thinking, believe that programmers spend all their time sitting in a cubicle, staring at a screen, and never talking to another human being. So if we want to get girls in computer science, we have to they don't quite use these words, keep it a secret that computer science has something to do with programming. So this is a little problematic. Um, but even more problematic in the sort of big picture scheme of things is that uh, we have two years of high school curriculum out of four years of high school and then um, nine years before that in uh, primary and middle school. Um, 
Oh, well, there's a third year of high school curriculum because after you take this course, the fun one, then you take the old APCS programming in Java that everybody hates. Um, so that's where we get rid of the girls, um, just to make sure that none of them go on to study computing in college. Um, so it's a crazy situation. Um, and these gaps are going to be filled in, if we're not careful, by curriculum developers. Curriculum developers, present company accepted, and I really mean present company accepted, all the rest of them, um, think that curriculum is a bunch of factoids that you learn and regurgitate on multiple choice tests. Um, Richard and Celia are going to tell me that that's only true in the U.S., right? Yeah. Um, and maybe that's true. I would be delighted to, to learn that. But, but even in this course that's supposed to be fun and not drive away the girls, uh, my favorite thing in the curriculum, IPv4 addresses are 32 bits wide, but IPv6 addresses are 128 bits wide. How many people knew that? Couple. <laughs> How many people are now feeling, oh, a great hole in my life has been filled? <laughs> yes. You do? Sorry? You're feeling that way. Okay, good. So now you understand IPv6 dressing. Um, and, you know, the usual stuff about binary numbers and, and, you know, all of that stuff that has nothing to do with computer science is in there. Um, so we're making a curriculum whose goal is to satisfy the requirements of the College Board, but also really be a fun programming course where you get to do stuff, you know, and, and learn serious computer science. Like, you know, recursive functions, for example, uh, which is not in their curriculum guide at all. Um, so high school will muddle through somehow. They'll, they'll work things out. Uh, I'm really worried about what's going to happen at the uh, elementary school level. Um, especially for very young kids who, the theory goes, are uh, too young to be able to program computers. Uh, because, you know, after all, they're pre-operational, right? Um, all that. Um, now, uh, Scratch has... Um, open some people's eyes to what very young kids can do. Although even the Scratch team has this new Scratch Junior that's aimed at, you know, young kids. Um, mainly, I guess, because it doesn't have variables in it. Um, the, um, you know, plenty of six-year-olds have been doing things with Scratch. Now, are they doing really sophisticated computer science things? No, not at all. But, you know, they're getting ready to. You know, so when they get to third grade and suddenly become able to handle variables, uh, you don't have to teach them how Scratch works. Right? But I'm worried that instead of doing that, they're going to teach them um, a computer consists of a processor and memory and input devices and output devices, right? That's what they're going to teach them. Why? Because you can put a multiple choice test question about that. Um, and because the teachers who are doing this work understand that, right? That's perfectly understandable. Um, not true, of course, um, but understandable. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a desperate need for intervention in the U.S. in the lower grades. Um, uh, luckily, the rest of the world has you all. Um, 
but the U.S. is pretty starved uh, of um, constructionists. Well, of constructivists, let alone constructionists. Um, uh, but to use words of fewer syllables, pretty starved of people who take kids seriously as people right now, rather than uh, future intellectual workers. Um, so it's great that they're talking about risk taking. It's great that they're talking about uh, students picking projects of their own design. Um, that's all wonderful. Um, it, but they're not really, really embracing the progressive vision. So that's the state of play um, in the United States. Um, so now I have to um, tell you a secret, which is uh, when they told me that I was going to have an hour instead of 40 minutes to talk, I said, oh my god, what am I going to do? So um, I'm going to show you some things that have nothing to do with my topic. Um, one of them is uh, this. It's about the um, sorry? OK. Like that. One of them is about the big argument that people have about blocks languages versus text languages. Um, this is a little snippet of code uh, from GP, which is um, the language that John Maloney, the inventor of Scratch, is now working on as a language uh, to be sort of industrial strength for adult users. And um, purely as a propaganda device, it comes with a little slider in the user interface. And when you slide the slider, here's what happens. Oops, if I can slide the slider. <laughs> and, and that sort of ends the discussion about blocks languages versus text languages. Um, and the other thing that I want to show you, how are we doing? Oh, boy. Um, well, I'm going to stop doing this, because I didn't make enough numbers. I was, at, I was aiming at a million numbers, but um, what I actually have is a mere 184,000. Um, because I'm, I'm on a slow computer. Um, and I didn't start this until this morning. But what you're looking at is a new visualization of lists. Um, and unlike what we had before in Snap, it lets you scroll through, um, could be a million, and it would still be fast to look at list items. And it achieves this by not being editable, <coughs> the list view. It turns out that um, much of what has made lists slow in Snap um, is something we inherited from scratch, uh, namely the fact that you can directly manipulate the list in the picture of the list that's on the stage. So this is a read-only list watcher. It's called a table view. Um, you can switch back and forth between views. And we're excited about this because one of the things we're supposed to teach in our curriculum is big data. Um, and I don't think we're ever going to have super big data actually all in memory at once. But <coughs> um, we can have, you know, hundreds of thousands, a million things in memory at once. And um, I haven't tried this before. So 
So it may not work. Here we have the squares of all the numbers in that list. So if I go up to the top, whoops, sorry. Well, first of all, it was fast. And that's because this is written in JavaScript um, rather than uh, using snap blocks. But um, as you can see, um, ah, no, you can't. All right, I'm going to do this. No, I won't. Can I drag this out? Yes, I can. Can I drag this? Yes, I can. And of course, you can verify for yourself that the square of 500,880 is 200, whatever that is. Anyway, that big number. Um, but even more interesting than that, is that I can have a two-dimensional view. Okay, so this is a list of lists where column A is the same as the original list, column B is uh, the square of that number. Um, so we can generate lists of lists, as I just did, um, or you can read them in. So you go out to some web API and you get back data in the form of a uh, CSV file, and um, you turn that into a list of lists, you, you know, parse it into a list of lists, and then we can view it this way. And again, um, scroll through it. And all that happens really, really quickly. So uh, that's a big new thing. It's um, really the first major SNAP feature that was curriculum driven. You know, we said to Jens, we need this for the curriculum. Um, and being Jens, he, you know, did it overnight. Um, uh, no, that's not quite true. It actually took almost a week. Um, but, um, so that's, that's the latest and greatest new thing. Also, by the way, behind this, this block fast map, let me show you what it looks like. Um, this is more of a technical thing for programmers. Um, because of the way snap scheduling works, until now it's been really, really hard to call a snap function from inside a JavaScript function. And Jens invented this thing called Invoke that takes care of all the scheduling stuff for you. Um, so now it's really easy and fast. Um, so this is map written in JavaScript. And um, you may not have seen the JavaScript function block, which takes a chunk of JavaScript code and turns it into a first class snap function. Um, so now we're in really good shape to do quick creation and uh, editing, programmatic editing of tabular data. So all the sort of database things like um, selection, you know, I want all the odd numbers from this, that's just a, a keep on this table. Um, slicing is a map where you want only certain columns. Join is a little harder. You have to actually think to combine two tables on a common value, but it's doable. Um, so um, that's, that's the exciting new thing in SNAP. Uh, what time is it? Nine, almost 40. Let's have some discussion. Let's go back to... Um, this question about curriculum and the future. Um, 
Say things. Uh oh. Right. No, she was being sarcastic. It's okay. Yeah, there's someone. So I'm an American. Okay. Um, so you're getting all this money, and uh, you have this great opportunity to uh, influence the curriculum. Um, what are your plans? Uh, I, I mean, I see the criticism of this. Yeah. Um, what are your plans to, to influence it? Right. Um, so we are um, currently engaged in a four-year project funded, NSF, National Science Foundation funded project, um, bringing our curriculum, The Beauty and Joy of Computing, uh, to 100 New York City public high schools. Um, <clears throat> and we picked New York City, uh, even though Berkeley's in California, uh, for two reasons. One of them is um, New York is a large urban majority minority school district. Um, that is to say all the white kids are in private school. Um, in New York, and um, we've been claiming that we can teach this curriculum to anyone, uh, but this is where we're gonna actually prove it or disprove it, uh, that we can do it. So that's one reason for picking New York, that it's large and urban. Um, the other reason is um, when you're applying for uh, a competitive grant uh, situation, um, it turns out Having New York City in the title of your proposal makes the reviewers take it really seriously. Um, so I'm, I'm convinced that that's why we got funded. Um, so how is that going to trickle so, out to all the yes, suburbs? And, right. Because you know, I'm from New Mexico originally, so I was in a suburb of a suburb. Right. So that's where this $4 billion comes in. So the, what we're funded to do right now uh, which is before the announcement of you know, all this money coming in, um, is two things. One is um, teach New York high school teachers to teach our curriculum. Uh, and the other is a, a complete revision of the curriculum. We're working with partners at Education Development Center, which is a nonprofit um, curriculum organization, and they know about high schools. Um, and um, some of the changes have to do with the nature of high school students. So um, when we wrote the curriculum for our own use at Berkeley originally, uh, a lot of it was pretty sketchy about what's supposed to happen today. And um, information was just passed down from one teaching assistant to another by word of mouth. Um, uh, but if we want it to be usable by high school teachers, First of all, they want to know what the curriculum actually is. Uh, and second of all, <clears throat> their principals want to see lesson plans, daily lesson plans. Um, and furthermore, the teachers are a little uh, anxious about doing it maybe. They want solutions to exercises. So we have to create all this material. Um, and that's the other part of our grant. Now, the dissemination part, um, Part of that $4 billion uh, is going to go into um, building up a core, C-O-R-P-S, of um, master teachers prepared to run teacher professional development. Um, so uh, we at Berkeley are not probably, unless you're in like the first year when we are still pretty much involved in it, we're not gonna come to New Mexico <clears throat> to teach your teachers. Uh, instead, we are developing curriculum for a professional development course, and we're taking teachers who have taught our curriculum to kids, 
and putting them through this professional development development, and they're going to come to New Mexico. I, I think one, one thing that is uh, a really big barrier a lot of times is this dichotomy, this false dichotomy against between coder and non-coder. And mm -hmm. I think um, whenever there's a, a, a teacher feels that there's this dichotomy at, at all, that that's when they start feeling intimidated. And that can yeah. compromise a lot of uh, plans because even if they're taught a curriculum or given a, a set of things to do, they might feel uh, incapable of doing it and in the end not actually execute it. Uh, Richard wants to answer that. No? Okay, well then let me answer this. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so in the curriculum, you know, right from day one you're coding. Um, in fact, on day one you make an app that you can run on your phone, your cell phone, um, which is pretty cool and it pulls kids in. Um, and the coding that you're doing in the beginning is easy. And we don't say special people called coders do it. And the same is true for the teachers. In our professional development, the teachers go through the curriculum. That's not all they do, but it's part of what they do. Um, and, um, you know, so there doesn't ever come a point where we say, okay, now it's like coding and before it wasn't. Um, until the very, very, very end of the curriculum where uh, we teach kids how to use recursive functions to implement higher order functions that say, like, apply this function to every item of this list, like the, the map thing that I was doing down here. Um, so we teach kids how to write this right at the end, and we say, um, everybody except us thinks that this is way, way too hard for high school kids. Um, but by the time they're at that point in the curriculum, it's not hard at all because they've done all the little pieces leading up to it. Uh, that's our claim anyway, we'll find out. We are currently in the first year of um, running classes for kids in New York. So uh, next conference, I'll have some actual hard data to report about what's doable and what isn't. Um, does that answer? Yeah, that, that answers. It, it's making me think of one last thing, which is, uh, I think, also critical to the success of this, um, which is uh, empowerment. So, mm -hmm. you know, if the teachers and the students feel, you know, not just that they're, you know, they have a cognitive ability mm -hmm. to be able to do coding, um, but also that they feel a sense of empowerment and uh, inclusion in the uh, greater community, I think, then, then I think that's yeah. when success would be assured. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, uh, putting on my Snap hat as opposed to my Beauty and Joy of Computing hat, one of the things we haven't done yet is a scratch-like front page where you see what other people are doing. You can share projects, but you have to do it by you know, emailing somebody a URL to your project. Um, you don't have the, I guess I want to say passive viewing of other people's projects, that it's just there. Um, but we definitely want that and we're working on it and it's coming. And, and so we do want to build uh, a worldwide community of kids. Are students making uh, in patches to the SNAP program? No, not in our curriculum, but... Um, is that a possibility yes. for them? Like yes, because we have this JavaScript function block. So, just, I Brian, mean, like, could we, I ask I'm, you another different question? Oh, yeah, well, actually, we have a lot of people wanting to ask questions. But, but I've uh, got the microphone. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Sorry. That's fine. In the, in the, uh, I, I'm confused about the NSF competition. And that what I understood is that there were three of you, three different projects that were awarded. I'm actually not sure what the, what the number was, but it was a small number, yeah. And that the, uh, two of them were using Scratch and one of them, one of them was using Scratch and the other was using App Inventor. 
and I found that strange. So could you comment right, okay. on that? Right, okay. So um, apart from the NSF competition for funding, um, there's a, an informal competition, I guess you'd say, for attracting uh, teachers and school districts to the curricula that people write. Um, and at the beginning of the process, you know, on a previous round of funding that was broader, um, something like 20 different groups were developing curriculum. And there's been a kind of shakeout. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> The App Inventor one comes out of a group in Connecticut, um, and their big thing is that what attracts kids is, you know, apps, right? That's what kids like, and I'm sure that's true. Um, so their curriculum revolves around that. There's one called um, Thriving in the Digital World out of Texas, um, which I forget what they program in, but their curriculum isn't mainly about programming, the way ours is. It's mainly about um, connecting computing to other stuff in the world. So um, they have a lot of, um, so when they do do the programming, it's sort of in the context of some real world need um, that you can develop for. Um, and they, you know, besides the programming, they do research about what's happening in the world about these things. So that's the third one um, that has a lot of uh, strength in it. Um, then there's code.org. Um, code.org is, um, it's like a two-headed monster, you know, the good side and the bad side. Um, Code.org really made all this happen because they started out saying um, what we know how to do is publicity and they made um, uh, one of the most viewed YouTube videos ever um, with little snippets from people like um, Bill Gates, you know, and, and I forget, some rapper. Um, about the importance of coding. Um, and this sort of woke everybody up. And they also invented the hour of code, which, you know, this week, everybody in the world is going to spend an hour learning to code. Um, and those things are, you know, trivial, and, and you don't really learn anything in an hour. But uh, they definitely raised awareness on the part of politicians and so on, um, and, you know, school boards. Um, but then they, um, they sort of attracted all the funding, right? Because um, they were started by venture capitalists who know all the rich people, and they got all the rich people to give money to them and said, well, we're going to partner with other people who are going to make curriculum and teach teachers and all that stuff. And then they said, well, no, actually, we're going to make a curriculum and uh, we're only going to partner with people who use our curriculum. And theirs is JavaScript based um, and only partly exists. Um, but it's still uh, kind of taking over the world just because it's code.org and everybody knows who they are. So that's, that's sort of the, the players. I'm sorry? Could I ask a question? What about it? Oh, why are people using Scratch? No, one oh. of the awardees was using Scratch. Uh, yeah, that was probably the thriving in the digital world people. Um, I believe you. Uh, honestly, I haven't been paying attention to what everybody else is doing. I'm too busy doing our stuff. Um, but Could yeah. I ask a question? Sure. Um, as you noted that a lot of the people uh, here at the conference aren't from the United States, Brian, and uh, I think a lot of the conversation has been about what's happening in the United States, which is clearly yeah. incredibly important for us all, and we've all learned 
and use the products from the United States. But here we have a, a very vibrant constructionist community. And I wondered what we could discuss in terms of thinking about the opportunities. I mean, clearly there are huge dangers. That video from, that you said was shown in the White House is a disgrace. Yeah. It's a disgrace because every single presenter is male. Did nobody notice that? There were some kids oh, yeah. who yeah. were girls. Right. But I mean, for goodness sake, we should have moved on a bit. So I think, actually, we should need, think about this community. We've all grappled with this. We actually, in Britain, as you say, we actually have been doing computing from little kids up to, we have, are in, facing a huge number of challenges and we would love to share them. And we haven't got anywhere near the money that you've got. Right. But I think we should, as a community, discuss this issue. How do we make sure we do not make the same mistakes that we all did before in the 80s? And I think, yes, working in New York City, you're going to learn a lot. It's very different from, I don't know, other places in the States. It's very different from Thailand. Let's try and have a sort of world movement about this absolutely. and not just go yeah. down the same old road. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. That, that was my point in saying all this. Yes. So, I kind of the same idea. I. Uh, wanted to know how, if you're writing the curriculum or thinking about curriculum and thinking about computer science or whatever in terms of a constructionist uh, way, and you said, which is very true, that most educators or whatever in the United States don't even know what that word means, how can we take that, the ideas behind and the spirit behind the, the ways that you should be teaching this and, and try to and make sure that it comes out on the other end that way. Because when my experience working with SEP in, in New York City was I had all these things and they wanted, no, but what do you do the first five minutes? And when, then what's the assessment for that? And yeah. then where do you move on to the next? And it's like, so it was very hard. I had a lot of uh, battles to fight and I'm not there's not enough, I hate to say, like not enough people that on the receiving end that really understand. So how do we get past that to... Right, well, you and I definitely have to have a talk because you're in <laughs> New York, you know, we're in New York. Um, but <clears throat> five minutes, wow, that went quickly. Uh, and we haven't talked about anything but the United States. You know what, I'm gonna not answer that okay. because let's, let's get some other... Yeah. Gary, you're an American, but go ahead. <laughs> well, but we have this internet and airplanes now. Yeah. And borders are no match for bad ideas. Yeah. And I've read the British curriculum, and I've seen the Australian curriculum, and it reinforces all of the weakest parts that you mentioned. Yeah. So instead of arguing about where we're from, I think as a community we ought to do something about the bad ideas. Right. And, and like I said yet the other day, when the curriculum begins with counting in binary or bits and bytes or first graders will identify algorithm or because we have a scope and sequence, if has to be in second grade and then has to be in third grade, um, we need to stand up and say we know something about this and it needs to be different. Yes. Yes. Um, so again, I mean, my answer is sort of an American answer, which is because um, of this big push that's been going on, largely as a public relations thing, you know. Obama gets, yeah, Obama gets 20 people, 20 teachers to stand up at the White House and he shakes their hands, right, because they're computer science teachers. That's a public relations move. Um, but uh, because of that, I've been hobnobbing with assistant secretaries of education a little bit. Um, and so one thing to do that I definitely want to do is try and push on that, um, you know, on that connection, such as it is, not that, you know, it's a deep connection, um, and try and make sure that, that there is some thinking top down about good ideas and bad ideas. That's one thing. The other thing, though, is just generate good curriculum. I mean, our curriculum at the high school level, we have to satisfy the college board. What the College Board wants, and by the way, it was written by computer scientists, right? It's not as if, you know, uh, bureaucrats at the College Board wrote it. Computer scientists at the universities wrote it, but it's still full of garbage. Um, 
So we teach what we have to from that. Uh, but we try to turn it into something good. So they want us to teach binary. Well, let's write a function that takes a number and outputs a string of ones and zeros. And yeah, we're learning about binary, but at the same time, we're learning about recursive functions, right? So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, we're not going to completely take over the world, but we'll take over a little of it, and maybe, you know, anyway, that's all I think we can do. Somebody else? Can I ask one last question? So say a child, say yeah. a child, after this program, um, does not go into a computer science job, right. <laughs> or go to college for computer science, but has done all these activities. Um, what do you think the benefit is for that child oh. for the rest of their life? Programming, I mean, we've seen that, you know, upstairs in, in these few days. Programming, uh, creating stuff is just super empowering. It makes you feel like you can do things. And that's much more important than, you know, what I'm language you I'm asking what, what community can they connect to? Because, you know, I also took algebra, but I don't you know, use algebra on a daily basis. I mean, right, it's a good experience. Right, but in your algebra course, you weren't creating algebra. You were being taught how to crank through formulas, I'm pretty sure, um, unless you were very lucky. And, and so there is no community around algebra because there's no creating around it. Uh, there's an enormous kid community around Scratch, and it's hugely empowering, uh, not only in terms of sort of here's how to write a program, but... Um, in terms of like policing the comments in the forum is done, you know, the first level of that is kids, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Brian, you, you haven't really opened your curriculum too much for us. Could you <laughs> uh, give a little bit more, be a little bit more specific? Oh, Both the content yeah. and maybe the pedagogical strategies? Yeah, uh, we can do that. Um, okay, so... Um, Big overview, <clears throat> the sequence of events. Um, <clears throat> how SNAP works. Conditionals, abstraction, debugging. So uh, by the way, within this, we're trying to make it task-driven rather than feature-driven. So even though the name of this is conditionals, um, it's, you know, let's write a program that does this, you know? Uh, and you turn out to need conditionals to do it. Um, lists, so you know how to handle aggregations of data. Um, and then there's two units of stuff the College Board wants, uh, internet and algorithms and data. Um, we do more than they ask for. So they want kids to have some sense of um, <coughs> timing of algorithms, right? That some are inherently fast and some are inherently slow, but we actually give them orders of growth. We say, you know, here, these are linear algorithms, these are quadratic algorithms, these things are exponential time algorithms, so they're effectively impossible to do um, on large amounts of information, and then uh, these things are totally impossible to do theoretically. So we show them the halting problem. Um, Kind of nice. Um, and then the rest of it is recursion. Unit six is recursive commands, and unit seven is uh, recursive reporters. Um, so that's the overview. Uh, if we look at something in the curriculum, um, OK, so we're going to make a contacts list, like on your cell phone. Uh, and we give them a framework, um, and there's a button add contact and a button clear the list, um, 
Uh, but when you add contact, all it really does is get the person's name. Um, and we say, okay, now add the phone number. Um, <clears throat> and now um, find the person that matches a particular string. So have a button you can push that says, you know, find contact. Um, so they're sort of building UIs, but they're also manipulating lists and they're searching through lists and so on. Um, and they're learning in the process of doing that, they're learning the higher order function, keep items such that this condition from the list. Okay, so we kind of sneak in the technical details uh, as meeting a need. Um, so there's for you to do, which you know, is most of what there is. Uh, we've learned in New York that nobody reads the white stuff if it's more than two sentences. So we're trying to not you know, say a lot. Um, and now we're, you know, here we're modifying it so that it handles uh, family name first as well as given name first uh, people. Um, and this is getting into data abstraction. So we're going to talk about why uh, it's a good idea to have a reporter called family name instead of using, you know, item two of. Um, sorry, Brian. Yeah, sorry, time's I, up, yes. I think we're out of time. Okay. Maybe like one very last question from, yeah. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what changes you made to this curriculum to help engage girls more, like you were talking about the problems with older curriculums. Yeah. Um, we have not, we've been avoiding trying to do anything that is specifically directed to a certain population. So we're not looking for sort of girly problems, right? Or, uh, I mean, there, we saw somebody built a curriculum that has things like um, doing fractal pictures of hair weaving, right, to attract black students. We aren't doing that. Um, mostly what we're trying to do is refrain from turning people off. Because we fundamentally believe that this is a lot of fun. Um, and so what we do is try to have a variety of tasks. So in one lesson, there might be an art-related project, like, you know, make a Mondrian painting was one. And there are music-related problems, and there are math-related problems, you know about the traditional sort of factorial thing, just because some people do like that. Um, and then the language-related things, like uh, make a random sentence generator, um, which is, this is a great advantage we have. It's so much easier in English than any other language because we have no inflections in the language. <laughs> um, but it's doable even in other languages, obviously. Um, yeah, so that's it. We just try not to turn people off. Okay. Okay, uh, I guess we're out of time. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't think I would worry about running over. I thought I would worry about, you know, running out of things to say. Um, I'll be around. I'll be happy to talk with people, you know, in the break. Thank you, Brian. I would like to invite um, Dr. Sushin um, to present Brian with a, a small gift. Dr. Suchin is one of our original um, facilitators. He's been working, he had worked with Seymour um, since his very early days in Thailand.